10th and the 21st parallels north of the equator in the Americas lies the fabled Caribbean Sea. Once, when it was called the Spanish Main, it was an avenue of riches. It created a class of men like Captain Kidd and Calico Jack and Henry Morgan, men who put a new word in our language, buccaneer. And the pursuit of those who came to this new world was treasure of one brand or another. Yet to the far-sighted, the greatest treasure was trade, which brought all kinds of men to the Caribbean. Adventurers, merchants, planters, speculators, and, naturally, sea captains. Of course, some say there's no treasure left in the Caribbean. Well, I say there is. Rich treasure. And, believe it or not, it can be yours. That's right. Of course, you have to know where to look for it. And I suggest that you ask the cruise director and the chief officer where you can find the real treasure of the Caribbean. You see how the Caribbean lies, rimmed in on the east by a stepping stone chain of islands linking two continents? As a cruise director, I've come to know the lands of this sea pretty well, and I've seen their treasures. Not the sunken galleons of gold or Captain Kidd's rumored fortune. Treasure can cover a lot of things, so many of them intangible. I found them in the atmosphere of old West Indian ports, in great modern progress, and in the quiet enchantment of land that have hardly changed in centuries. There are treasures like these, ports like Curaçao, so different and colorful they'll take your breath away. Mountains at La Guaira that climb several thousand feet straight out of the sea. A little of old England in Bridgetown, Barbados. Antigua's great fertile valleys unrolling sugar cane to the horizon, encouraged by the right mixture of the rains and sun. There are plantations where the cocoa trees grow and flourish in the shade, yielding their beans to be spread and dried in the sunshine of St. Lucia. Coconut trees in Venezuela, tranquil and majestic on the tropical landscape. But each one is a challenge when the harvest is on. A reminder of another time and Venezuelan haciendas now century old. There is the Caribbean's own kind of music. Steel barrels make strange instruments, but from them the West Indian coaxes a peculiar and haunting rhythm. And the tropical forests are as you've imagined them, dense and secret and yet fragile and lovely within, producing the Vanda orchid, the hybrid anthurium, the leper lady slipper orchid, the yellow lady slipper orchid. A new way of life emerges where immense natural wealth is fashioning fine modern cities like Caracas, but in the jungles of Suriname, the old ways are just as determined. In villages like this, where the patterns are centuries old, and bread is yet made by pounding and straining the cassava root. Yet, not far away are modern resort hotels and other glamorous standards of the 20th century. Here you relax in the highest degree of ease and luxury. and the pace of pleasure goes on into the night. Sure, it's modern and luxurious in the Caribbean, but do you know why? I'm a ship's chief officer, and I can tell you. It's because this area and North America are trading ideas and commodities for mutual profit. 
You'd be surprised at the variety of cargo that comes out of the hatches. One boom will be easing up a drilling truck to search for new oil fields, or unloading a big yellow cat for heavy duty jobs. Fruits and vegetables come out of the refrigerated holes. From another hatch come cargo containers with fragile goods. The freight that comes out of the ship represents scores of manufacturers. It's a good bet that we have unloaded every kind of truck you can name. We see lots of oil pipe for one of the Caribbean's biggest industries. And there's always a steady flow of lubricating oil. The main idea is that all of this cargo reaches its destination in the same shape as we picked it up in the States. Our shipping services give the exporter the choice of a wide range of ports. New York, and Baltimore on the Atlantic seaboard. Mobile, and New Orleans on the Gulf Coast. The exporter knows the money that can be saved from having several ports of exit available to handle his shipments, since inland freight rates will favor certain ports over others. These rates actually divide the United States into regions, and so it can be quickly determined which are the cheapest ports to use for any given area. And it's easy for the shipper to learn how he can save money on this inland freight business because we have 23 offices from coast to coast to brief them. We'll help him plan consolidation of his various shipments into economical carload lots. And at the port of departure, we'll take the cargo in the consolidated car and ship it according to Caribbean destination. It is wide coverage in our area of operations that make this service possible and saves the exporter money he'd otherwise have to spend on handling charges. You can count on this with our service. The men will be experienced and the machinery they use will be right for the job. There's a certain experience required for each kind of cargo. Flour is a good example. It's got to be stacked right on the pallet and it's got to be kept clean and protected in the hole. You make sure that the bags are discharged as fresh and clean as when the exporter shipped them. Perishables like these fresh fruits have to be handled with the same amount of care on the pallet and in the refrigerated holes. These two things, experience and care, count most toward the correct handling and delivery of cargo. I can tell you just as emphatically that taking care of passengers is a case for experience and care too. Travelers aboard one of our cruise ships expect comfort and service. Cruise ship accommodations are ship-shaped and modern. One of the most important comfort features of all you can't even see, air conditioning throughout, in every stateroom, no matter what its size. As a passenger, you know the comfort is there the moment you enter the room. It's bright and it's modern. Quiet and restful for sleeping. And above all, it's designed for cruise living. Each room has its private bath. Here are accommodations arranged for entertaining and spacious for lounging. First call, last call. And who misses this invitation? A day of sea and sun is over, and there are sea air appetites to be satisfied. 
and they will be satisfied with good food. A menu long and select captures anybody's fancy. Meal time in the dining room brings a gay and friendly atmosphere, and it's one of the most enjoyed pleasures of life aboard this cruise ship. It is life at sea as you like it. A deck life centered around sunshine and ease and, if you wish, activity. There is shuffleboard. And deck tennis. Exercise and leisurely chats at the outdoor pool. And at high noon, a supreme treat on deck, a smorgasbord with all the frills. Those long, lazy days at sea will be punctuated now and then by the excitement of a day ashore in a foreign land. You'll dream of ports that lie ahead. There is Jamaica and the pulse of commerce and traffic at King and Harbor Streets. Ciudad Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, a vibrant modern city built round its ancient landmarks. And Venezuela's capital, Caracas, a city of Fifth Avenue shops and swift thoroughfares like the Grand Avenida. The dependable welcoming committee at Guanta, Venezuela. Pastel houses at Curaçao in the Netherlands Antilles. These are some of the picturesque things and ports you'll remember. Sometimes freight handling is picturesque too. In ports that don't have deep water piers, we take the cargo ashore in lighters. Barbados in the British West Indies is one of these. And it's a pretty sight to see the bobbing lighters alongside a large ocean-going freighter. When the lighters are loaded with cargo, a string of them is towed across the harbor into Bridgetown's careenage. Years of Caribbean shipping experience can teach you how to handle lighted cargo or freight destined for a modern dock. Cargo handling requires precision and care. Even tires, not easily damaged, are neatly stacked on pallets. Box-packed cargo, like these chemicals that could damage easily, are protected by cargo nets. Trucks, automobiles, jeeps, and tractors are delivered as unmarked as they left the factory. Spreading gear distributes the weight correctly and along with protective chafing bags, keeps the wire ropes from making scratches or dents. Follow a typical sling load of Caribbean general cargo and watch how experience and care come into play. These washing machines have been evenly stacked on pallets down in the hole, this side up. Protected with a cargo net, the washers are eased down to the apron. An efficient forklift truck takes over. The 
washers are tucked neatly in place in the warehouse, in perfect condition, ready for their consignee. Cargo that is shipped to the Caribbean is used by peoples of many nationalities. The Carib Indians who gave their name to this great inner sea are long gone. In their place there is an amalgam of peoples from the world over. The Javanese came from the Indonesian archipelago, the land Columbus thought he had found. The Chinese came in great numbers to plant sugar and rice and before long to establish a strong merchant and professional class. From India, the Hindu and the Muslim emigrated with their Asiatic cultures intact. These lands of sun and opportunity also lured many Northern Europeans from their harsher environment. The Dutch came and settled and raised fair-headed West Indians. And there are settlers who keep their Danish traditions like tea and cookies. In Caribbean lands under the French flag, gendarmes walk their beats. And the Spanish who first came to the Caribbean have not let their representation die. The Portuguese have contributed their talents as merchants, traders, fishermen, and seamen. And to this corner of the world has also come England with its own patterns of work and play. And of course, many represent ancestries that have been blended and re-blended for generations. Some of the Caribbean's peoples have taken quickly to ways their forebears never knew, as on the playing fields of the West Indies, which produce cricket players counted among the world's finest. In the smile of this old Moby Tea woman who bends her brew of bark and water on the Bridgetown waterfront in Barbados is reflected the warmth and hospitality one finds in the Caribbean, no matter what the individual background. On any morning, the color, the noise, and the character of a West Indian town are concentrated in the market. Here, the pulse of everyday Caribbean life is typically revealed. The iron market in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with its bizarre oriental towers. The floating green groceries of Willemstad, Curaçao. Maracaibo, Venezuela, shops at Todos, the last word in supermarkets. Ciudad Trujillo in the Dominican Republic has its clean, efficient Mercado. The market in St. Lucia. In this marketplace at Fort de France, Martinique, the haggling is in francs and sous. The sprawling riverfront market at Paramaribo in Suriname. It furnishes a daily fashion show with the strange costumes of its cotty missies, who do vociferous battle over the high cost of living. Now, just a minute. The marketplace is my dish, too. The shops of sophisticated Caracas, Venezuela, are on another side of Caribbean marketing. And this grand avenida is a Latin American miracle mile. In its swanky stores, you find American products imported for the Park Avenue taste. Decorators items for the home. Fancy cocktail dresses and formals. U.S. imports like these often find their outlet through the services of our offices in the United States and in the Caribbean. Our Trade Development Department maintains the facts on growing and potential markets. Two-way trade is stimulated 
by putting businessmen of these two areas in touch with one another and giving them up-to-date market information they need to know. The American automobile, famous world over, is a byword here too. From Jeep to Cadillac. With the help of American construction products, Caracas is building at an astounding pace. Thousands of tons of steel and steel products are helping to build skyscrapers, office buildings, apartment developments. Cement is poured around the clock to match the pace of construction. And all kinds of well-known U.S. machinery are the tools of this progress. Yes, you'll find the Caribbean ahead of the field in building progress, like this firehouse, and this hospital, and these residences. It is part of the great charm of the Caribbean that these can exist side by side with the Hindu temples, Mohammedan mosques, Spanish courtyards, a French chateau transplanted. The Parisian touch in a sidewalk cafe. The remnants of the struggle for the new world. Sidelights of China. Postcard scenes with a Dutch accent. And houses built on an African blueprint. This potpourri of cultures points to the much varied influence upon the Caribbean history. Spain made the first mark with Columbus, and here in the Dominican Republic, in a church over 400 years old, is his tomb. The island was called Hispaniola when Columbus' son Diego became the first viceroy of the Indies. From this once magnificent palace, he governed the new empire. Spain was not the only nation to look hopefully westward in the 16th century. This is Castries, capital of the island of St. Lucia, a town that has changed flags almost a score of times. It was a rich prize with a splendid harbor, but the price was dear in an island of rugged interior and a rugged coastline, marked by these famous twin cones, the Pitons. The long historical tug of war between Britain and France is remembered by this British citizen of French descent who is still surrounded by the old French names. All over the Caribbean, one can trace the influences of the past by merely reading the street signs. But there are no street signs to remind one of the boisterous past of Port Royal, Jamaica. This was the homestand of Henry Morgan, ruler of an empire of cutthroats. In front of this church, Morgan held his inglorious councils and drank his rum. And when England knighted the pirate to gain his support, he, perhaps ironically, donated to the church his favorite silver rum mug gained from the spoils of Panama. Port Charles at Port Royal was one of England's greatest bastions, well suited for the command of England's famed Admiral Horatio Nelson, whose glory at Trafalgar is never forgotten. At the northeast corner of the Caribbean is another place well remembered as one of Lord Nelson's early commands, English Harbor on the island of Antigua. This small but deep and hidden harbor sheltered a great navy yard operation. Nelson's command post was a simple frame house, which now serves as a modest museum for his effects. While at Antigua, Nelson met and married the young widow Fanny Nesbitt. To her, he brought gifts and trophies from his voyages, including a China dinner service of which a single plate remains here in their former home. In Nelson's day, chinaware and other fine products could be found only in the large cities of Europe. Now, travelers recognize the Caribbean as the bargain hunting ground for imports from all over the world.
And of course, there is the excellent native handicraft identified with the Caribbean itself, like this mahogany ware in Haiti. But while we're buying luxuries from them, the Caribbean is buying staples from us. Take Venezuela. It alone spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year for American goods. From a single ship at LaGuaira, look at the variety. Flour. Fruits and vegetables. Thousands of boxes of canned and packaged foods. Tractors. Refrigerators. In fact, every kind of thing needed to feed, clothe, and house a growing nation. La Guaira is not only Venezuela's principal seaport, it is the front door to the cosmopolitan capital city of Caracas, lying in a mountain valley just the other side of the coastal range. Today there is easy access to Caracas from La Guaira over a highway that was an outstanding job of engineering. Once you took over a hundred hairpin turns and hit an altitude of 5,000 feet. Now it's only 20 minutes to the capital through mountain tunnels across bridges that span great gorges. It was the bulldozers, tractors, and rollers built in the U.S. that furnished the tools for the job. Caracas, a city that can grip you like Paris or New York. Physically vast and intricate, excited by a new and fabulous cosmopolitanism. Now its people live at a swift, big city pace but a pace that is tempered by the gracious traditions of old Venezuela. It's a city with a long memory, especially for Simon Bolivar, the most honored of the country's national heroes. In its fine schools and universities, education strides ahead. While Caracas works hard to build a great future, its people turn to sports for relaxation and pleasure. Some sports, like golf, are adopted. But in bullfighting, there is also the traditional. States is baseball. from oil, thousands of oil wells pumping vast reserves. There have been great petroleum discoveries across the nation, like this one at Lake Maracaibo. But even with huge known deposits, the search for new wells goes on around the clock. Oil is not the only natural prize men have found in North and South America. Across the jungles to the southeast are the mines in Suriname, producing bauxite ore, which gives us aluminum. 
Getting to these mines in the Guiana jungle can be a wholly different kind of travel adventure. There are modern passenger carrying ore ships by regular schedule between Trinidad and Suriname, the country better known as Dutch Guiana. In air-conditioned accommodations, one sails up the interior rivers of a dense jungle land, seeing a primitive equatorial region from a vantage point of complete personal comfort. That's right, but this isn't strictly a sightseeing trip for passengers taking a jungle cruise. The main reason for this ore-carrying route lies in a remote town called Mongo, and in hundreds of acres of brick red fields. Here bauxite is so rich that it pays to mine it within a few miles of the equator, though it must be transported to the United States. This is a modern mining operation today, but it did not come without great effort. Vast tracts of little explored jungle had to be cleared. Today, the town that is called Mongo includes good houses well-equipped schools, dairy herds to furnish milk for children. Hundreds of workers keep the bauxite moving into the plant where it is crushed and the excess moisture removed in huge oil-fired rotating kills. The bauxite is then ready for shipping in an ore carrier. While their ship is taking on ore, the passengers can forget civilization momentarily in the villages of the Jukas. These natives are the descendants of sturdy African tribes who escaped from slavery and found freedom in the interior jungles of Suriname. In the Jukas, one finds a pure, transplanted African. The design and style of the implements they use to comb their hair to paddle their canoes, to pound their bread mash have been passed on without change from generation to generation. They are a people asking little of the outside world, but always willing to welcome you, or wave you a friendly farewell. Now, with several thousand tons of bauxite, the ship will retrace its course down the jungle river out to the open sea, and in two days arrive at Tembladora, the bauxite transfer station on the island of Trinidad. Two major operations go on simultaneously at Tembladora. On one side of the pier, the ore carriers from Suriname discharge their bauxite for temporary storage. and passenger cargo ships receive full loads of ore for delivery to U.S. refining plants. Bauxite can be handled here, in or out, at hundreds of tons per hour. By the combination of an ore delivering service and regular northbound sailings, this supply line for America's aluminum industry operates 24 hours a day. Tembladora and Trinidad are the hub of this company's foreign operations. And it's a port that almost every passenger, cruise ship or freighter, gets a chance to visit. There are several freighter arrivals every week, each carrying up to a dozen passengers in cheerful, comfortable staterooms. And of course, the biggest passenger arrival comes with the regular dockings of our cruise ships. For these cruise passengers, there is a special day of local activity ashore. Drivers and cars are waiting for the early start. It's a 15-minute drive to downtown Port of Spain, past the Royal Botanical Gardens. Around the roundabout as you pass through the savannah section. And in 
to the bicycle and auto traffic of the commercial streets. There is a temporary halt for bargain hunting in the shops of Frederick Street. The shelves and counters carry the evidence of the fine goods for which England is famous. Later in the day, you might want to return for more shopping. Meanwhile, you have a date at Maracas Bay on Trinidad's north coast. You have pictured in your mind the ideal tropical beach. And here you found it. A wide swath of white sand, a fringe of coconut palms, clean water, and a lively surf. It's a place to play and relax and work up an appetite, which the ship stewards have fully anticipated. And maybe the high spot of your Trinidad memories will be the evening that follows at a club in Port of Spain. A man may be looking smart and trim. You know, he hates to know a woman is smarter than him. But when he joins me, he runs direct and handy lady his whole paycheck. It's not me, it is the people who say that the men lead the women astray in Trinidad. I say the women of the day, they are smarter than men in every way. Let's put men and women together. I say to put men and women together to find out which one is smarter. Some say men, but I say no. I say the women pull the men wherever they go. the things anyone can find in the Caribbean. Easy, relaxed days in a fine ship. A fresh atmosphere, a new way of life at each port of call. The fun and entertainment that awaits at sea and ashore. And with all, a feeling for the nature of things Caribbean. They are a kind of treasure, aren't they? you can put down my impressions of the Caribbean as a place to find a prosperous future through trade and commerce. I see treasure in the hundreds of shiploads of cargo every year, back and forth, both ways. Well, that's the story of the treasures of the Caribbean. Oh, they know the real treasures, all right. But you know, somehow, on every trip I find something new another treasure. I guess everyone can find his own treasures when he hunts for them.